It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Welcome back to Wine to Five, everyone. Or if this is your first time listening, welcome. Yes, every Thursday. Gosh, we're so generous. Every Thursday, Val. Every Thursday. We're, I know, each and every one. <laughs> we are dropping some wine edutainment for you. So be sure to subscribe to this podcast and make sure we're in your phone or whatever device it is that you like to use each week and you are ready to play with us. Uh, speaking of playing, Steph, what are you drinking up there? You've got that beautiful cocktail. What's left of it's it? It's so pretty. It's so pretty, <laughs> and it tastes good too. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it's pink. It's actually kind of got a little bit more of a red color than pink, but in celebration of Valentine's, because you know this is recording on Tuesday of Valentine's, and so I had an unopened bottle of Plymouth Slow Gin, mm. and yeah, so I was like, that's really sad. That slow gin has never been opened. So, yep, I opened it just to make the Moulin Rouge cocktail today. And I found the Moulin Rouge recipe on drinksmixer.com. And we do have a link in the show notes for you guys. But it's got the slow gin, sweet vermouth, and, you know, you probably guessed, you know, I have the Antica formula because that's the one I like the best. And some Angostura bitters in it. So the recipe is posted in the show notes. You do a stir with some ice and get it really cold. And then you put it in, uh, you serve it up in a chilled cocktail glass. And it definitely has that like tart, kind of like a tart berry flavor and some nice sweetness to it, but I don't like super sweet drinks. Mm -hmm. So this, this is, goes down really easily, I'd say. And it's easy to make. It sounds delicious. I love all of those things. So, and it's a really yes. pretty cocktail. I've watched stuff kind of draining that, uh, during our interview <laughs> with our guest, which we're going to get to in a minute. Yes, but first we have to hear about what you're drinking. Oh my gosh. And so so most people know I'm kind of a grump when it comes to like Valentine's Day and Christmas. I'm like, I could do without the whole thing, but I am a fan of my manse and I am a fan of my wine. And I am drinking, it's a 2007 Fontaloro from Felsina Berardanga. It's 100% Sangiovese and it is drinking really nice. I mean, this is one of those wines that does need a little time in the bottle. Did you give it enough time? Well, it was it's an 07, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's been 10 years. We opened it last night. It was fresh out of the wine chiller, so it needed a little bit of time to open up and kind of talk to us a little bit. And we had it with some veggie pasta sauce that I made. I'm digging it today. It, it opened up really nicely. Day two. Sometimes that's where it's at. I'm telling you. Yeah, this is absolutely delicious. And the color is just absolutely beautiful. I mean, you can see it's a nice garnet color. Because, you know, Sangiovese... Oh, hold it up a little bit higher. Oh, I'm sorry. My camera. There you go. Yeah. So Sangiovese <laughs> has a tend to, tendency to oxidize. In fact, on a blind tasting, it's a nice giveaway for those of you studying for things because you can see that nice garnet to orange brick, bricky kind of rim. And mm -hmm. so when you're lining up a couple glasses and, you know, one of them Sangiovese, chances are it's, it's the one that tends to oxidize a little. It gets a little bit more orange a little faster. So. Right. Yeah, a little geeky, there you go. Our, our low anthocyanin friend, as I like to call it. <laughs> but yeah, speaking of friends, oh my gosh, listeners, we are going to just plug in an interview for you guys in a minute with Kathy Hoyha. She is currently a writer for Forbes.com. She writes about the business and politics of the wine industry and is the author of this book I have here in my hot little hands right now called Hungry for Wine, Seeing the World Through the Lens of a Wine Glass. And she's the co-founder of Enolytics, a data analysis tech startup for the wine industry. Kathy's writing has appeared in print and online for the general interest and in wine industry publications to include Harvard Business Review Network, The Atlantic, Decanter, Food52.com, where she was the Wine Unfussed columnist, Daily Beast, Boston Globe, The Washington Post, Wine Enthusiast, 
Global Post, Grist.org, and Daily Candy. And she has been featured on the BBC, WNYC, WGBH, and Nevada Public Radio. Listeners, we hope you will sit back and enjoy our lovely afternoon conversation here on Valentine's Day with Kathy Hoyha. Oh my gosh, thank you for being here. And for our listeners, we are talking with Kathy Hoyha, and she is the author of this book that I have in my hand, Hungry for Wine, Seeing the World Through the Lens of a Wine Glass. And I remember this is one of the very first things I read while I was finishing up an exam last year. But for those listeners who haven't read this book, could you tell them a little bit about what they can expect from the book? Yeah. So, so first of all, one of the, one of the things to know is that it's organized into 12 chapters and each chapter is about one bottle of wine. And so it's like a case of wine and a case of stories, like a book of stories. I talk about how every bottle of wine, each of those 12 bottles of wine, the story of how it made it to your table and how it got in your glass. So there's sort of, there's everything from South Africa and how wine builds community in post-apartheid South Africa. There's wine from, from Turkey, where it's, it's forbidden to market wine in mm-hmm. Turkey. How, how do you do that? There's wine from, from Lebanon and Syria. And how do you make wine when your country's at war? And there's, um, there's wine from Napa and, and Calistoga, where the, the winemakers are so hungry, literally so hungry for wine that they're willing to do whatever it takes, work two jobs, work three jobs, whatever, just to keep the lights on at the winery because they're that, they just feel that strongly about it. That's kind of the organizing principle of the, of the book. And hopefully it's, it's meant to be a quick read, not to sort of not long, not pedantic, and hopefully, hopefully enjoyable. And I think what I, what I like about it is I've got it open to chapter eight, because this was the chapter Mm -hmm. that I remember the most is how to make wine when your country is at war. And the story of, you know, how you're making wine in Syria, but the way the book is laid out is it's like you said, it's not long paragraphs. It's not, it's not really pedantic. It's just very short verse, which is how I like, I like my emails. I don't like long paragraphs. You know, I used to tell my guys, I'm like, you write to me in bullet statements unless you're a colonel or above or I'm not reading your emails, you know, when I was military. So I really <laughs> like the way the book is, is written. It's a very easy read, like you said, and it's it's digestible. Fortunately, it's, it's gotten some some positive reviews, some positive press. But one of my favorite comments about about somebody who's read it was com- was from my mom. She said, you know, I learned a lot about my daughter, she said, plus it was easy to read. Very <laughs> there good. you go. That's, that's my that's mom. A win, that's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, that pretty much captures it. Mm-hmm. Well, and so how did you know that you wanted to write a book? I mean, you know, what, how did, what came over you and how did you know in that moment, like, this is what I'm going to do? Yeah, so that's a great question. I feel like I've, I've always been a writer since I was really, really small. Um, writing is, is what I, is what I felt is, is my, is my thing. Um, I just, I loved it. It came, so words just came. Um, and so I've been writing about wine for about 10 years now, 11 years. Um, and for the past three, three and a half for Forbes online for the most part. Um, and the advantage, one of the advantages of that is that it gives you really, uh, an idea going in of the angle, the angle of the story that, that you're looking for when you, when you open a bottle or visit, visit a wine region or whatever. Um, and it's about the business and it's about the politics of, of what happens of the wine industry. So the, the longer that I did that, um, the more it became clear that what I was trying to do was, was build bridges. I was trying to build a bridge between wine and the people who were my primary readers, who, who are, who are a more general audience. They're not wine people, quote unquote. Um, but even though they may not love to talk about tasting notes or, you know, the acidity of a, or alcohol level in a wine, everybody loves a story. So I was trying to find the bridge between the wine and what that audience was already interested in. And at some point it became clear that that I had, I had enough content, I had enough material um, to organize, uh, to organize this book. And that was sort of the, the idea and it, and kind of the concept is always that 
there will be more Hungry for Wine books. Mm -hmm. um, this one has wines from all over the world um, where I could sort of keep going with it. Hungry for Wine Italy, Hungry for Wine France, Hungry for Wine Sonoma, Hungry for Wine Tasmania, you, you name it. Um, so there's always a little bit of a long game there as well. It's Have you started any of those other uh, sequels? Have you? <laughs> the, most, the most obvious one to do next is Hungry for Wine Italy, um, because I spend probably the most time there more than anywhere else. Um, but I'm also drawn to Sonoma, Hungry for Wine Sonoma. Um, and it's just, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, um, seductive to try to, to try to pick one because they, they all have their, their appeal for sure. I think it's interesting when you go into Amazon, and this book is in our store too, by the way, listeners, but it says frequently bought together, Hungry for Wine and Thirsty Dragon. China's uh -huh. Lust for Bordeaux. Did you know that? Uh, I did not know that, but that's a great book. That's okay. a great book. That one. Yeah. And then there's another one called Vino Business by Isabella Saporta. So I think mm. it's interesting that those books get put together. When Hungry and thirsty. Hungry and thirsty. <laughs> yeah. I think that's Hungry and thirsty. And I guess the I guess the idea of, of the hungry part, I mean, of course it's a it's a crazy title. Like who's actually hungry? Like you're not hungry for something to drink. You're right. thirsty for something to drink, right. um, but there's there's more there's more to it. There's more of the um, sort of the, the gut thing that I that I try to get into. Right, right. Yeah. Well, what about analytics? Talk to us a little bit about that. Give our listeners the scoop on analytics: the what, the why, the how, the where. Yeah. Gosh, analytics has been one of the most exciting things I've ever done. Um, the the word, the concept, has been in my head for about four years now. But I, I didn't, for the longest time, I didn't see it. I didn't see how it was going to come together. I didn't, I didn't know what it was going to be. I knew it was going to be about wine and technology. And that was a lot of what I was covering or, or was covering at Forbes. Um, so in a way that the writing that I've been doing for the past couple of years has been sort of casing the joint. I was sort of figuring out what's being done, what's not being done, and maybe what, what can be, what can be done sort of in the openings there. Um, so about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, um, it just the opportunity arose for me to tap into this team of data scientists, um, real scientists who, who, work, um, who work with data every day of their lives. And they were interested in sort of, um, again, an, another bridge. They were interested in bridging um, what they do normally with, with the wine industry. Okay. And so... It was uh, this sort of coming together of a lot of of a lot of opportunities and a lot of really exciting things, and um, it's been it's been amazing. It has been really truly um, one of the most exciting, challenging, gratifying, frustrating, all of those things kind of all wrapped up together, and really really fun. So, who are these scientists, and what data are you trying to get? out of your endeavor here? Yeah, so so there are, we have a core team of three data scientists. Okay. And they all I live in Atlanta and as as do they. So they're they're right here. Like I you know, I, I see them on a very regular basis. Okay. <laughs> and they are coming actually from the healthcare background. Okay. Uh, so they're they're coming from outside the industry, so they've got fresh eyes. Yes. Um and I think that's a I think that's a an asset. Um, it's also yeah. a little bit of a relief for them because they are dealing with, with healthcare, which in some cases is a life or death situation. And now we're like, okay, so let's think about wine. And they're like, okay, let's think, let's do that. And so the, the data that we're focused on is consumer data. So we try to sort of tap into, um, thanks to technology and all the platforms that wine is communicated on about, all of that generates data. So platforms like Vivino, uh, they're a very important partner for us and a footprint of 22 million people all over the world. Um, Hello Vino was our very first data partner and absolutely critical, you know, for getting us off the ground. So we tap into consumer sentiment and behavior around okay. wine that's sort of um, created or generated on these on these platforms. Okay. Yeah. And is your content is your content on analytics free and available for people to 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 look at to use i mean how is the user experience and what kind of feedback are you getting 
Yes. Uh, one of the most fun things I've been having is writing Analytics 101 posts, uh -huh. which go yeah. out um, every Friday. And that sort of explains topics that are happening around the office and things that and things that we're engaging with. The data itself is is not free. Okay. Um, we actually purchase the data. That's sort of the relationship that we have with our data partners. Okay. So we have we have clients, we have customers uh, that we work with, and they uh, they engage us, and then we figure out, considering what questions that that client is asking, we figure out who the best data partner is, and then we work with them to sort of get the insights that they're looking for. Okay. This and is so cool, Kathy. <laughs> It's really, you know, and it's it's a little bit like we just had to put it out there. We had yeah. to put out this concept. And the questions that have been coming up for the last eight or nine months have been really, um, who knew that companies were thinking what they were thinking and who knew that it was um, kind of a, a qu the innovation, if there's any, is the idea of literally going and knocking on the door of these data partners and saying, can can we tap in? Can we tap into your data? Okay. Um, and it's kind of pulling them together. So that is, um, there's been skepticism as well and some pushback. And so we're a little bit in a, in a stance right now of knowing that we need to educate, knowing that we need to sort of uh, show proof of concept and demonstrate how it all works. But that's completely fine. Like we, that's, that's where we're at and we're in it for the long haul. And it's, it's really fun in the meantime. That's Very great. Cool. I can really appreciate too, and so can Val, because I came from a pharmacist background. Mm. So you're partnering with healthcare. I totally get that. And Val and Val's fiance is a pharmacist too. And there is kind of this compliment in so many different ways about healthcare and and that the science part but behind that and uh, the data collection and everything else and and this wine world so I, I really appreciate what you're doing and and that's really what I was most excited to hear about in this interview was what you were doing with analytics so that's yeah. so cool it is very cool to see the science and the wine because a lot of people think of wine as something fluffy and artsy and I live with a scientist because he's got other mm. scientific things going on and having and after I did my master's, I learned a lot about, you know, the way to approach data. You know, how rigorous was the data research? What are the sources? You know, every time somebody says they say, I'm like, who's they? Who said it? How credible right. is that source? How did they get their data? You know, what was the universe? Yeah. What was the sample? I took statistics, you know. And, and so, yeah. yeah, it is something that in this right. household we're all about is where's the data? Right. And there's... and. There's a lot to be said for other industries who are doing amazing things, amazing things with data. Healthcare is one, financial services, manufacturing, entertainment. These are all just ahead of the curve and really maximizing or really getting the potential out of data that you can. And so the exciting thing is what can this do for wine? What, you know, how can we, how can we sort of take those models that fortunately our team knows and our team understands um, and apply that? To, to wine and to and to better serve consumers. That's so that's really uh, that's really the goal. That's like cool. That. So you're very, very excited about that. And we can all tell it's like really coming through the audio. I know all of our listeners are like, you know, feeling like they just got a dose of Kathy, the real Kathy right there. But <laughs> What do you enjoy the most? I mean, do we already know the answer to that? Uh, you do so many things, writing, speaking, teaching. Um, I can see that you're involved in philanthropy with your bio. Is there something that you're most passionate about and, and or that just feels like that's where you're at your best? That's a really great question. As I tried to think about how I wanted to answer this, every time I thought about it, I... I there was a different answer. <laughs> and so the way that when somebody asked me, um, what's my favorite wine? You know, my, my standard answer is the wine that's in my glass. Mm -hmm. And so what's my favorite thing to do? A little bit, it's um, what, am I, what am I engaged in right now? Where, where's my heart right now? Yes, sometimes it's teaching. And I, I teach it, um, I just came back from a week in, uh, in Bologna teaching uh, MBA students in, fine, in food and wine 
at the Bologna Business School, which was amazing and allowed me to sort of tap into millennials and what they're thinking right now about the issues that are facing their generation when it comes to wine, when it comes to food. So that is amazing. But I also have been doing more and more public speaking. And the advantage of that is reaching, is reaching the audience, you know, in a human way that's, that's right there in front of you. Um, and so I, I really, really appreciate that. But then I, I suppose, um, if there was, if I had to kind of nail down an answer, it's what I'm doing in, in the quiet of, of the early morning or in the late night or sort of when my, when my mind is, is settled and my mind is most focused. What I'm doing is I'm writing. Mm-hmm. And I guess that would be, my ultimate answer, uh, with it, so the caveat that um, these other things really generate a lot of energy, a lot of really great energy for me as well, and it gives me things to write about. It's hard, and it's just amazing, uh, sort of universal generosity that I get to wake up and and do these things every day, mm-hmm. and I'm just incredibly grateful for all of that, all of those opportunities. Well, when you're not doing all those things, I'm sure you are out and about and you're near Atlanta or in Atlanta. Mm. In Atlanta. In Atlanta. Mm-hmm. So talk to us mm-hmm. a little bit about the food and wine scene, because we always kind of seem to have food and wine scene envy for, for people that come on the show. Like when Eric Asimov was on the show, we're like, mm. well, he's in New York. You know, he's right. got all these great restaurants, you know, and we just right. we kind of have restaurant and wine bar scene envy <laughs> for a lot of places in the world. So tell us about Atlanta. Yeah, so I feel like if I were to ever write a guidebook about about how to get to know a city, there's there's three things that I want to know. One is their bookstores. Mm-hmm. One is their yoga studios. Yep. And the <laughs> other is their wine bars. That's what that's my that's my that's my thing. Those, yeah. if, you, if you got those three, we're good. Like I'm, yeah, good, I'm good. We with are good. City. I'm good with this city. And Atlanta has amazing, in my opinion, amazing opportunities at each of those on each of those points um specifically to food and wine uh there's oh my gosh there's so much happening the there's a really strong urban agriculture movement in atlanta right now spearheaded by the food an organization called the food well alliance and there's more than 300 urban farms or, or community gardens within metro atlanta and the city just hired um Mario Cambardella, who is the first ever director of urban agriculture for the city of Atlanta. So that's a really exciting thing. There's a, a new, there's a lot of urban renewal happening as well. Um, there's a, used to be, I think the largest Sears Roebuck building. Mm-hmm. It's like 12 million square feet or something like that, that the city has, um, sort of regenerated, reinvigorated into a multi-use, uh, complex. So really great restaurants in there really great wine opportunities in there, farmer's markets. Uh, there's also sort of the kind of a, a, a green path around around the city uh, that encourages cycling and more farmer's markets being organized around that. So those are some of the things that are not only sort of the tip of the iceberg, but um, some of the things that are happening food and wine wise in the city. Very cool. Yeah, I it is. no cool. idea. I know, and not, the people think of the South and they think of Nashville as they should, and they think of Charleston as they should, and New Orleans. Um, and I feel like Atlanta just is really stepping up to the plate in a lot of ways. Yeah, well, that gives me a new perspective on Atlanta, I think, because I'm always like, oh man, I got it at the traffic, and da, 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 you know, but I, like most good cities, like big cities have a lot to offer. And so, it's just asking the right people like you, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> well, tra- it's true. Like, I'm not going to argue with you about the traffic problem. Traffic's yeah. bad. It's true. Yeah. However, another really exciting thing um, that I've been involved with is called the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, um, which opened up two summers ago on land donated, donated by Coca-Cola um, in, in the center of the city. It's world class. It's absolutely world class. Atlanta has, um, of course, like other other cities in the south, um, a strong and often volatile uh, history of, of racial justice and human and civil rights. And Atlanta has just put in um, a lot of a lot of effort and a lot of resources into showcasing what that means to the city, to the country and globally as well. It's not just civil rights, it's human rights on a global scale. Mm-hmm. So that's another exciting um, another exciting thing that's just adding energy to the city. 
And for you listeners, I yeah. uh, can't see me. I've just been nodding my head the whole time like a big old <laughs> dork. So <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think it's it's great to have you on the show because we're just like we're like kind of kindred spirits. We're like, yeah. That's good. That's like, we're really into that. We're into that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I love it. I love it. So, you know, convening, we'll do this live next time. From, live from Atlanta. Oh, my gosh. We do, we live do from enter- Atlanta. That would be great. We do entertainment. We do media in Atlanta for sure. Yeah. Yes. So, Wine to Five Roadshow listeners, start thinking <laughs> about that. <laughs> That's right. That's love right. It. Well, so there's a lot of excitement and energy in all of these things that you're doing, Kathy, but what specifically has your laser focus? My laser focus, um, I, I have to say, is, is analytics right now, partly because of as everything that I said earlier, but it also is an opportunity um, to stretch my, my muscles of communication. Yes, I'm writing about it. Yes, I'm, I'm talking about it more and more. And I'm becoming, um, hopefully, more able to communicate the potential and what it is that, that we're working on. The more, the more clients that we work with and the more questions that we sort of integrate and metabolize into what we're trying to do. It's not hard for me to get up and work on analytics. There's a, a momentum to it, but also a strong desire um, to, to get it out there and to have it be of use, truly, to the industry. I think that success... I've heard it defined, but when you wake up in the morning and you want to get out of bed and get going because you're so excited about what you're doing with your life, I mean, when you were just talking about that, it's like I don't think people realize that that you, you're, you're successful just because you love what you do. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be measured against any kind of you know recognition or financial reward or something. It's like... When, when you know that, that you're, you're waking up and you're not like, oh, no, here it goes again, Groundhog Day, you know? Mm. But you've got so much going on that you're excited about and how it's going to help the world or how you're going to share something with the world. That's, that's awesome. So congratulations for all that. Yeah, thanks. And it's... Um... It's true. And the weather, you know, who, who knows where this is going to go? You know, yeah. it, it was, it didn't even exist like a year and a half ago. Um, and who knows where it's going to be a, a year and a half from now. But I, I feel like uh, if we can add to the conversation, if we can add to sort of the thinking um, of, of the industry from a, especially from a business point of view and from a reaching consumers point of view, uh, consumers are, are telling us what they want. Consumers are, are telling the wine industry what they're interested in. Um, there's no shortage of voices now. Um, and we just, we need to listen. Yeah. We need to listen. Yeah. yeah. Well, what about the winemakers who want their voices heard through their wine, who want to express their culture and their history and their tradition, just like in Suzanne's book? And, yeah. And, you know, and it's like maybe trying to find those consumers who are willing to listen and, and and drink there too. So it's it's kind of like do we do we shape the wine industry? Yes, if you don't have consumers, you don't buy wine. But there's something to be said about the sense of place. And and I know it's so heavily vaunted and touted, but it's what I want to drink. I don't want to drink what I think is the ideal wine. Like you said, I don't have a favorite wine. My my wine is the story in this class. You know this this Tuscan wine or the Piemonte wine. And and I kind of want to listen also to the producers. Right. And I think that one of the takeaways for me um, so far uh, from, from what we've been doing and also from, from writing for, for so long is that there, there's a community for you. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there is. There's a community for you. And just as you said earlier that, you know, if, if it doesn't have to be sort of, you know, accepted by 15 million people, like it, there it could be a community of of a hundred people, mm-hmm. but if they're your community and if they make you happy, you know we're we're good. Yeah, we're good. Right. Yeah. And so I feel like that is um, it's funny, but that's sort of a takeaway from from big data is that it's small, it's small. Like every 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 data point that we have is is one interaction, it's one gesture mm-hmm. from a wine consumer, 
And it's kind of the accumulation of those or the aggregation of those that adds up to big data. But every time somebody's somebody's telling us something, somebody's telling us something about what they want in their glass and who they want to find, who they want to find there. Yeah. And so I think that there is a way to for winemakers who who have a story to tap in to the people who want to hear it. And no, it's not everyone. It's not going to be everyone. No. Some people couldn't care less. But there are those of us who, who do. And I think the potential is there to, to really reach them in a, in a real way. But that's that's the good thing. And I, I used to say when I was younger, you know, when ice cream, I used to work for Baskin Robbins. I'm like, you know, if everybody wanted chocolate, there wouldn't be any any left for me. <laughs> you know, it's just like we can't. It's okay that we don't all want the same thing. It's just a matter of trying to find what it is you want. We don't have to shape the world around what we want. It's about how to find it. Yeah, I like that. I like that perspective. There's there's enough to go around for everybody, and and we all don't need to love the same things. There is, there is, and it's so easy to get sort of swayed by by what's popular right now, or kind of what's hot right now, or what's trending right now. Um, but there's a little bit of staying the course that I try to hone in on. Right. And we had that talk with Karen, when Karen McNeil was on here too. She's like, don't ask me about trends. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I remember you know? that. She was like, nothing is trending. Nothing is up, you know, because there's so, there's something for everybody. And I really like the way she, she put that. But for the fun side, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, what you're doing, your projects, your analytics, analytics, getting it working. I did see a really cool picture. I believe it was of a Bernese mountain dog <laughs> on your Skype picture there. So talk about your fun. What do you do mm. that's not wine and food related? What do you do for fun? And, and tell us about that dog. So Coco, Coco. Is, is about <laughs> to start barking any second now because she's like, where are you? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so her name is Coco, and she's so fun. She's so loyal, and she just she just makes me happy every day. And she's my writing partner when I'm up at five in the morning writing. That's my that's my time. She's at my feet, and she's she's fluffy, and she's big, and she's loyal. And she just I move, and she moves, and she's beautiful. I also have well, my family. My husband is Belgian, and he's my blessing in this world. And we have twin boys who are 11 years old, and they're a walking comedy routine. <laughs> <laughs> they're hilarious. And in terms of, of what we do for fun, we, we travel a lot. Um, and I have been doing yoga for about for more than 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And when you said earlier, you know, you 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 wake up in the morning and you go and you you do what you want to do. Yes, absolutely. I'm lucky enough to do that. But I also pause to meditate or to do asanas or or something like that because it's a tremendous exercise in, in focus and sort of staying, not letting all the squirrels take over. Yes. It's, um, yeah. That's, or the that's, monkey or whatever. Yeah. The monkey mind. Yes. All, all, all of that. All of that. Um, all of so especially as I, as I get older, meditation has taken on a significant role in my ability to really kind of stay the course and mm -hmm. hold steady, especially among kind of everything, all the all the noise and all the chatter that happens um, every single day. Uh, it's sort of the, the quietness that I try really hard to tap into. And it just, it's like I want to bathe in it. It's like I want to um, swim in that, in that moment. But it, it kind of suits me up for the day, so to speak. Can I ask you something since you, yeah. you do the yoga and the morning thing and, and my mornings are, are very sacred because I used to get up, go to the gym first thing. And that was like before social media. Now I have a thing where the phone does not come on until 10 a.m. So there's no social media, no emails, none of that. It's working out or yoga or both. I might do a little bit of both and then coffee. And only when that's all done do I dare dip my toes in the craziness of the world and get going. And which is, again, like you said, it's a joy. There's no more not in your stomach on Sunday night knowing tomorrow's Monday that that ended, you know, nine years ago when I retired. But, you know, do you do that? Do you do you give yourself time away from that phone in the morning? And do you have a, a rule of when you turn it on and get engaged in the world? Yeah, there's um, that's a great question. And I don't have a hard and fast rule. But what I do know, and this is from when I was a kid and my whole family was a big family, rural Pennsylvania. We all had newspaper delivery routes same in the here. morning. Yeah, same here. Right? Pennsylvania right? and a newspaper route. No! Yes! 
<laughs> Pittsburgh. I'm from Pittsburgh. Yeah. Mount Carmel. So oh, east, okay. So eastern Pennsylvania, coal region. You yeah, yeah. we were coal. Yeah. Anyway, that's pretty hilarious and a little bit scary. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So uh, since since then, I wake up and and um and the first couple hours of the day are always the most productive time that I have. And so it's actually a little bit of a question every day. What what do I do with those two hours before everybody else wakes up or whatever, however much time? And it's it's sort of become, sometimes it is walking Coco, um, but sometimes it is, I've got, I'm on deadline and this has got to get done. Or sometimes it's, you know, this proposal has to get out. So although I'm not, I mean, I, I recognize that those first two hours are absolutely the most precious to me in terms of productivity and creativity, creative thinking, it changes every day what I actually do with them. Very yeah. Cool. No, because I was, Steph has caught me a couple times. She goes, look at you, early bird, get in the worm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so you have to go, you have to go with how you're feeling that day. It's not a hard yeah. and fast rule. Sorry, Steph. No, yeah, I was going to say that I heard something like, an entrepreneur has control over their morning and nothing else. I mean, it's like you can get really focused and do what you need to do, stick to a list when you wake up in the morning. But but once the world knows that you're up 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever it is, it's like their agenda starts to, you know, encroach on your agenda and your checklist all of a sudden is like, you know, see you later, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a little bit like I mean there's but still there's 168 hours in the week or something like that. Yeah. There, there's actually a lot of time, and so I think that um, that kind of a pivot moment for me was when um, my relationship to time pretty much changed, um, and that yes. happened when I became a parent of twins, mm -hmm. and that really changed what I did and how I structured my time um, because it it came down to to knowing when I what hours of the day were best for me to do such and such a thing. Mm -hmm. And that really helps with, with structuring and not feeling overwhelmed um, and sort of letting the important things go until I'm tired at the end of the day. Uh, because I'm such an early riser, if it doesn't get done by 6 p.m., it's probably not going to get done. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, right. But I, I think my relationship to time, um, actually becoming a parent, has helped that tremendously. Um, surprisingly, maybe. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Well, you know, we could go on and on. I think if we had, you know, uh, 10 more questions, I would just be thinking I had the best day ever here with sitting with the girls. <laughs> and we just need to get Kathy a drink so yeah. that we can all hang out longer. <laughs> but, but because we do have to mind the time and everybody's day, the very last question and we'd like to ask all of our guests this, is to tell us your favorite embarrassing wine story. Oh, my God. There, like, seriously, there are so many. Like, <laughs> I, had, I had to, like, think about this and pick one. So I'm just going to pick, like, the most recent, okay. really embarrassing there you go. wine story, which is that it was in France. It was in, it was, um, in the Rhone, the Southern Rhone. And it was a rainy day. It was it was kind of miserable, and it was an early morning tasting. And I'm walking out with with my friends and my colleagues, and I just take a header, like I take a header, and I just fall flat on my face. And it was it was like I like I brew, I tore my pants, like I, I had a black and blue mark, and it was just it was terrible. There's no way to fall gracefully. There's no way to fall gracefully. I mean, I, I if anybody can, let me know and like send me a video or something because. I know that I cannot, um, <laughs> and it just was, you know, it was one of those things, and it's fine. So, so fine. So, you, so you get up and you dry yourself and you laugh and ha ha and you right. Laugh. But it was, yeah, that's probably the most recent one, <laughs> even that's though there so has, there's been a catalog of them. Did did the wine did the wine go down with you? You know what? I didn't have any in my hand, like okay. I at the moment. At the at that moment, it was all still back inside. Did <laughs> anyone go. take a picture? <laughs> well, I'm happy to say that no, no one took a picture. But they did help me up, which was great. Which is great. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Nothing to see hey, here. Move on. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Move on. Happened. 
let's go. Let's sort of get in the car. Yeah. That's good. Oh, shoot. Yeah. It's just a matter of time before all of us have that story, I'm sure. <laughs> you know what? There's no way to do it gracefully. Mm-mm. Yeah. No. <laughs> but that's a good one. Well, Kathy, this has been so great. Thank you so much for, you know, being a part of our show today and um, and also engaging with us on Facebook and social media. And it's fun to connect some of our uh, networks that overlap and, you know, oh, you know so-and-so? Oh, hey, hey. <laughs> hey. Yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure. And it, it's really a pleasure to hear your questions and also to, to see you, you listening to the, to the answers. I, I appreciate that very much. Yeah, I was uh, taking a few notes here, too, so we'll have a little bit of stuff for the mm-hmm. blog, too, so I don't have to go back and transcribe. Good. So, yeah, but we appreciate the thought that you put into the answers as well, and... I'm sure our listeners are going to really, really enjoy our chat with you. I wish we could just chat the rest of the afternoon, but, you know, again, <laughs> we have a relationship with time. <laughs> and sometimes time is the boss. So. <laughs> and this has been an incredible use of mine today. So thank you very oh, much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Give Coco some love. Coco's the best. Coco's the best. She's going to run out in 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay. All right. Bye. Oh my gosh, Steph, wasn't that a blast? Oh my gosh. I think uh, my face almost hurts from smiling so much. Like the head bobbing and the smiling, it was almost a workout. It really was. I I think I just sat here and nodded my head a lot like a dork because I just so connected a lot with what she was saying and the way she approaches life as somebody who gets to sit down and do what they want every day. Her energy is really infectious and she definitely radiates happiness, you know, about what she does. And even when she talks about her family and, and Coco, Coco, the dog, I know. So cute. she's so. such a, she's a beautiful person just, you know, and, and just, it just comes through. I'm so glad that we were able to use our video actually, because it just enriched the, the time with her even more. So that was terrific. And I really do look forward to meeting her in person because I bet it's just 10 times more electrifying. I agree. So we need to get on with our Valentine's Day here. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take it home, Steph. Well, for Valentine's, we have lots of love for our Patreons. So thank you so much for supporting us, especially our tenacious tasters, Jeff E. from The Hilarious Drinking Show. We like drinking. Lynn from the wine blog, Savor the Harvest. And Sebastian from Sassy Italy Tours. And to our It's Not 5 O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners, thank you so much. Meg from South Dakota. Clay from AZ in the house. John in California. Andrew in Illinois. Shout out to Chicago. And Michelle in Nevada and Aswani in California. Thank you guys so much for being a part of Wine25 and really helping like share the love and listening and, and interacting. Thank you so much. And just in case if this is the first time you've listened or as a reminder for all of our diehard listeners, we do have a monthly Patreon drawing that we started in January of this year, 2017. So uh, at when you become a, a Patreon at the $2 a month tastemaker listener level or higher, you will get entered into a drawing for a bottle of Albarello Luxury Hand Soap and... If you want to learn more about all of this goodness, you can go to our patreon.com forward slash wine, T-W-O-F-I-V-E podcast and check it out. And share the love because that's what we're doing. We're doing this today. We're doing it every day because if you love Wine to Five and we know you do, you'll share our show with your friends, with your online community. And we totally appreciate your feedback, your involvement. Whether you're leaving us a burning wine question on SpeakPipe or a glowing five-star review on iTunes, we totally appreciate it. And for your listening pleasure, guess what? iOS, Android, whatever, we're on iHeartRadio. You can play with us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Google+. Also, you can build your collection of wide books and accessories, just like the one we were talking about today, Hungry for Wine, at our online store, also located on our website. You can connect with Val, on t- 
you can connect with me on Twitter. I'm Val. I'm at Wine Gal Unboxed on the Twitter and on the Vino with Val Facebook page and on Instagram as Vino with Val. And Steph, well, you can find her at Alborello Soap on Twitter and on the Alborello Soap Facebook page. And you can check out the videos on her Alborello YouTube channel. She's also on Instagram as the Wine Heroine heroin as well as pinterest and what about kathy our guest today well guess what you can find her on facebook as hoy hoy kathy that's h-u-y-g-h-e kathy and you can find her on twitter and instagram as kathy hoy hook c-a-t-h-y-h-u-y-g-h-e but one more thing guys don't forget to use our new hashtag Hashtag wine oops, that's W-I-N-E-O-O-P-S to share your funny wine moments, whether you're taking a header outside of a own winery or whatever that embarrassing wine story is, go ahead and share it with us on social media. We'd love to hear it. But till next week, everybody, cheers. cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash wine T-W-O five and tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips.